they deserve help and we need to help them. So. Yeah, it's just, a, it's, a, it's hard. It's, it's very hard. On the grim five-year anniversary of BC's declaration of the overdose crisis as a public health emergency, those working on the front lines saving lives are speaking out. They say five years in, and they're still barely keeping their heads above water. British Columbia's restaurant industry finds itself preparing to have indoor dining banned for another month. It's the latest blow as many businesses find themselves already on the brink, with many having closed up for good. Depression, anxiety, mental health, um, they all came into play. The same as with Amanda. A new documentary is tackling the epidemic of cyberbullying through the eyes of Amanda Todd's mother. Amanda took her life nearly eight and a half years ago after suffering years of online abuse. Today marks five years since the province declared the overdose crisis as a public health emergency. And over the last five years, more than 7,000 people have died from illicit drugs in B.C. Today, the province's Minister of Mental Health and Addiction says the government is acting on calls from police chiefs and public health officials and officially seeking federal permission to decriminalize the personal possession of drugs. We know that stigma drives people to use drugs alone, to hide their drug use and consume alone, and this is fueling the overdose crisis. By taking this step, we can address and reduce the fear and stigma and shame that keep people silent about drug use. Unlike COVID-19, there is no vaccine for people who use substances, for people who have addictions. Decriminalization of people who use drugs is an important step forward, and I am pleased and happy that we are moving in that direction in this province. Minister Malcolmson says the upcoming budget will include a boost of $45 million over the next three years to enhance overdose prevention services around B.C. It's too much to take. You know, you're dreaming about people dying. It's a tough, tough day. Tough day for myself. They're tired of seeing people die. That's the message coming from those working on the front line of BC's overdose crisis as the province marks the grim five year anniversary of it being declared a public health emergency. I live in the downtown east side, so last night there was ambulances going all night long, and it's just really hard thinking, you know, you know, people who are sleeping outside and um, you wonder if everybody's going to be okay in the morning when you go to work and sometimes they're not okay. Sarah Blythe is the co-founder of the Overdose Prevention Society and works every day to try and keep people in her community alive. But with an increasingly toxic drug supply, it often feels like a losing battle. I've had times where uh, there's more than one person who's died that we know or we've been close to over the years. So. You know, it's just never, it's not, a, it's not normal and it's not good and it's, it's a terrible thing. People need some hope. People need some, you know, some, uh, some support. After nearly 20 years of being homeless and battling addiction, Guy Felicella has come out the other side. He's now a harm reduction advocate and says he's emotionally exhausted watching people lose their battles with addiction. I've lost a lot of friends over the years and uh, this continues to happen and the, the small friends that I have left that still use drugs, you know, I worry every night about them. I wake up thinking about them and... Um, yeah, it's just, a, it's, a, it's hard. Paramedics don't judge, but they are there to help. And it's tough when you when you see the impacts of uh, drugs on society and, and families and, and uh, friends. Troy Clifford is president of the Ambulance Paramedics of BC. He says paramedics are seeing firsthand the devastating repercussions of the overdose crisis. And it's taken a toll on their mental health as well. When they go to a call and see a tragic situation of, of, uh, of an overdose, you know, in, in and, you know, in a, in a loss of life and the impacts on family and friends, that, that takes its toll on paramedics. There's no question. 1,716 people died in 2020. That's a 74% increase over 2019. I really hope that at a certain point, uh, someone sees the numbers and goes, you know what, we really got to do really what's right here and just get on with it, um, which would be getting people safe supply in a really meaningful way. In New Westminster, Ashley Burr, City News.
rally was held on Vancouver's downtown east side this afternoon to mark the fifth anniversary of the crisis being declared a public health emergency in B.C. People marched through the streets of the neighborhood and held signs and photos of loved ones who've passed away from an overdose. Organizers also handed out clean heroin, cocaine and methamphetamine to a pre-screened group of adult drug users. Their goal was to raise awareness about the urgent need for a safe drug supply. The government is not responding quickly enough and many of us are suffering massive psychological trauma. We did not want it to come to this. We are doing what we have to because we must, not because we want to or this is fun. This was a very scary event to put together. It is obviously illegal and what we need is a change in the public policy immediately to stop our community from dying. There are 1,168 new cases of COVID-19 in B.C. tonight, and six more people have died in the last day. The province has also set a record when it comes to the number of people in hospital. 397 people are receiving care tonight, and 120 are listed in the ICU. We're expecting an update tomorrow afternoon with some new modeling information from Provincial Health Officer Dr. Bonnie Henry. It's still not clear if any additional restrictions will be brought in, but Health Minister Adrian Dix says people need to keep going and keep doing their part to stay safe. Right now, the rules apply to everybody and to stay safe, to ensure that the people you love stay safe, it's important to follow those rules. So wear in, in indoor public spaces, you have to wear the mask, the physical distancing, the washing of the hands, all of those things. And of course, the gatherings, they apply to every single person. As of today, anyone 50 and older, born in 1971 or earlier, can register for their vaccine. On Friday, anyone 45 and older, born in 1976 or earlier, can register. And anyone 40 and older, born in 1981 or earlier, can sign up on Monday. You can register online at gov.bc.ca forward slash get vaccinated. It really messes you up, especially emotionally and mentally. A business trip over the border to import store product turned into an expensive ordeal. Just ahead, a Vancouver business owner is warning others about her experience trying to get home. The challenges for us are obviously moving products, keeping staff employed. The province is expected to announce the ban on indoor dining will likely be extended possibly through the May long weekend. It's the latest blow in a year long effort to curb the spread of COVID-19 that's left the industry in tatters. Health Minister Adrian Dix said Wednesday afternoon that a formal decision has not been made, but that he won't be surprised if Dr. Bonnie Henry makes an announcement in the days to come. We need to keep um, doubling down on, on ensuring physical distancing because this is a virus that uh, transmits through social interaction. You know, when less money's coming in, there seems to be more money going out the door. Justin Tisdall owns a few local restaurants, including Juke Fried Chicken. He's glad to be takeout heavy and to have a patio, but says just running the patio isn't enough to get by. Expenses, I'm trying to either build a patio or adjust your patio to the new COVID restrictions. And he adds government programs intended to help are still a far cry compared to the business that's been lost. It's definitely not the same as generating your daily revenues. We're fortunate as a business that we do have a patio and we do do takeout, whereas not every other restaurant business is lucky. It's a situation Pino Pastorero also finds himself in. He owns Chapinos in Yale Town and employs 45 staff. He says it's only thanks to a supportive financial partner he's been able to stay open. He actually has the patio space and could have run it during the winter, but chose not to. It's like having indoor dining on the patio closed with less air circulation because there is no air conditioning, there is no air flow circulation. He's grateful for the work health officials are doing, but also feels businesses like his are being singled out. If we're doing just the restaurants and you go into malls and they are full and you go to retail stores and they are full, what, what is the meter? What is the reasoning behind? At the same time, the province's restaurant association says it's ready to see the ban extended, but is hoping for a big comeback later in the year. Uh, the industry after a year has, is, uh, it, it's beleaguered. It's lost staff, uh, maybe taken on debt. Restaurant groups have closed a number of locations. Are we going to get stuck in a bog of low revenue, low revenue and debt? Or do you think we're going to have that shoot up of demand and a quick recovery? We know people are, are waiting to come back. I think it's going to be more of a, of a, of, a, of a line that goes up versus a line that goes down. We are going to lose probably 20 or 30% of the industry. And, and that's just tragic. 
but the the other part of the industry is going to be resilient. The current ban that's expected to be extended expires Monday. In the meantime, Justin hopes people will be patient and support his business and his staff. We're working really hard under a lot of pressure. Uh, they've got a lot of new service standards they have to hit with COVID protocols. So just really be kind to people in general. In Vancouver, David Zura, City News. Surrey RCMP say they're noticing more people are going against public health orders. Officers handed out nearly $17,000 in fines over the past week. One of the violations was at a restaurant on Scott Road, which allowed indoor dining over the weekend. Mounties say it was the second time this happened at that spot, and Fraser Health has been notified. I had spent a few hours in the morning going through making sure that, you know, all our I's were dotted and our T's were crossed. What was supposed to be a business trip over the border to import store product turned into a $3,500 fine and a mandatory quarantine for a Vancouver business owner. It really messes you up, especially emotionally and mentally. Joanna Milios and her husband Craig own the Granville Island Toy Company. Back in October, they say they drove across the border to import goods from their warehouse in Blaine, Washington without issue. But when they went down on Monday, they were question when they tried to cross back over into Canada. Processed the forms, handed them in. The customs officer then calls me back and says, why is there two of you? And he looks at me and says, well, you're exempt, but he's not. I'm like, well, why is that? Because it doesn't take two of you. I said, well, I just explained. I can't lift the boxes and I do the forms. So next thing I know, um, after asking him to show me, where it says this and so that I know for future reference he couldn't produce any information as to why we were not both exempt. Uh, handed my husband a $3,500 fine and uh, forced him into a 14-day quarantine. Milio says she understands the current restrictions requiring all land travellers entering Canada to provide a pre-arrival COVID-19 test and submit a suitable quarantine plan. But she was under the impression both she and her husband would be exempt for the purpose of commercial importing for the same business. Obviously, we were within the guidelines because I was considered exempt. But for some reason, even my husband as a business owner was not considered exempt. It seems like they keep changing the um, whatever are the requirements to enter Canada, right? At one point, there was no COVID test. Now there's a COVID test. The Canada Border Services Agency tells City News they are unable to provide comment on specific cases and explain the decision on whether to pursue any enforcement action related to the public health orders is with the Public Health Authority of Canada or the police of jurisdiction. The CBSA also pointed to Canada's order and council, outlining traveller obligations and requirements for testing and quarantine. According to the Government of Canada's website, those who may be exempt from taking a pre-entry test or going into quarantine includes persons in the trade or transportation sector who are important for the movement of goods or people. Either they're both you know, exempt and they fall under the, uh, the quarantine exemptions or they're not. Milios would like the government to clarify what the rules are around having multiple business partners travelling to the U.S. together to import goods, something she hasn't been able to find out after hours of searching. Not able to come across anything that would imply that only one person is exempt. The Public Health Agency of Canada did not get back to us before deadline. In the meantime, Milio says she's not thinking about importing anytime soon and will be disputing the fine. It was really unfair in a time when we're trying to, you know, survive and we have these exemptions, but then we're told, oh no, well, your exemption doesn't really apply. In Vancouver, Miranda Fatour, City News. Boaters are being warned to be extra careful around an injured humpback whale spotted in the water off Vancouver. The conservation group Oceanwise says the whale was last seen near Vancouver's Point Grey with a deep cut on its tailstock. Whale watchers reportedly first noticed the wound three days ago, believed to be from a vessel strike. The humpback whale population has made an impressive comeback in the past 50 years, but are still impacted by human activity and are listed as a species of special concern under Canada's Species at Risk Act. I wouldn't want anyone to have to go through the pain of losing a child. 
It's been about eight and a half years since Carol Todd's daughter Amanda took her own life after suffering years of online abuse. Now Carol Todd continues to speak out against the epidemic of cyberbullying in a new documentary called Dark Cloud. Well, when you talk about cyberbullying, we're talking about you know, technology and, and being behind a screen and, and saying something horrible or nasty and, and sending it to someone else without having to see them face to face. And it gives them courage to be behind a screen. In Dark Cloud, Carol Todd shares Amanda's story alongside two other individuals, Brooke and Justin. And it also educates viewers on recognizing cyberbullying. I have been verbally attacked. I have dealt with cyberbullying. Brooke tried to take her life. Amanda and Brooke and Justin all went through horrific um, actions of others and they all went through um, trauma because of those actions. In a nine minute viral YouTube video posted on September 7th, 2012, Amanda shared her experiences of bullying with a series of flashcards. A stranger sexually exploited her and blackmailed her and she was also bullied by fellow students. On October 10th, 2012, Amanda took her own life. These events sparked a global conversation around bullying, cyber abuse, internet safety, mental health, and gender-based cyber violence, a conversation that Carol Todd is determined to continue. We have Amanda's story and what happened to her. She experienced um, real-life bullying, she experienced cyberbullying, exploitation, um, mental health, and She's not here to share her story, but I can share her story. And if, if we can help to save other lives and inform others on what to do if they're experiencing cyberbullying, it, it's, it's worth it to me to keep going and doing this. The Dutch man accused of extorting and criminally harassing Amanda was extradited to Canada in February and is charged with extortion, criminal harassment, communication with a young person to commit a sexual offense and two counts of possession of child pornography. It feels really good to know that court proceedings are beginning and there will be a trial this coming fall. Um, there were parts of me that thought that it wouldn't, wouldn't happen but now we know that it has and, and um, lots of people all over the world are, are waiting for this trial and waiting for the outcome. Viewers can stream Dark Cloud online as part of the Real to Real Online Film Festival, which starts on April 14th. In Port Coquitlam, Kier Junos, City News. One of the men who led the successful bid for the 2010 Vancouver Winter Games is about to make a pitch for the region to host the 2030 Winter Olympic and Paralympic Games. John Furlong will deliver a plan to the Vancouver Board of Trade on Friday that he says will encompass more of BC than the Lower Mainland and Whistler. Furlong says the cost of bidding for 2030 would be a fraction of the $36 million spent on the 2010 bid and that the games would cost less because venues are still in place. Well, as many businesses in the restaurant industry struggle to survive this stretch of the pandemic, we're shining a spotlight on some of your favorite places for takeout or patio dining. Starting Monday, News 1130 and City News Vancouver are teaming up for Plate It Forward as we showcase some of your favorite Lower Mainland restaurants. Send us a photo of your favorite meal from your favorite spot. It could be either takeout or on a patio. We'll be featuring some of those restaurants and you could win $100 to spend at your favorite eatery or to try something new. Send your submission to news1130web at rci.rogers.com. And don't forget to include the name of the restaurant, its location, your name, and city. And let us know what you love to eat there and why. Good luck.